Welcome to Permission to Kick Ass, a podcast about leaving self-doubt in the dust, punching fear in the face, and taking bold action toward your biggest dreams. I'm Angie Coley, and let's get to it. Hey there, and welcome back to Permission to Kick Ass. With me today is Amanda Holmes. Say hi, Amanda. Hi. I love this. They won't get the video and you're back there cheering like, yes, yeah. that's fantastic. <laughs> love the energy. Love it. So tell us a little bit about your business. Yes, I am CEO of Tread Homes International, which was started by my father 30 years ago. We've assisted a quarter of a million businesses to grow faster, better, smarter. We have 12 Ooh. core competencies on how to double sales, which came from my father's bestseller, The Ultimate Sales Machine, which I just worked on for the last four years, the new edition, which is coming out. So it's very exciting. Oh, wow. That's super exciting. I know like, I've heard of Chet Holmes time and again, as I have grown in my business skills and my business knowledge. So, wow, that, that sounds incredible. How did you get started in that? Was it always like a family succession plan or? Absolutely not. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, no, my uh, father got ill. He got diagnosed with cancer and mm. um, uh, ended up passing at 55. And at the time I was a singer songwriter and had no understanding of when people would ask me, what does your father do? I say, he runs companies. <laughs> that was my response. <laughs> I had no idea really. And, uh, then there I was 24 with a couple hundred staff, all double my age. And I had no idea how to run a world-class, you know, consulting firm. And yeah, here I am eight years later of being CEO and yeah. <laughs> wow. That yeah. sounds incredible. And I love that you led with that. Cause I didn't actually know that you were a singer songwriter first. I knew yes. that you were kind of thrown into it, which obviously is why I asked the question the way I did, but I was also a singer for a long time. Well, I guess I still am. Uh, I just don't have a band. Uh, and I knew that one of the big blockers that I had for the longest time was, well, I'm a creative. I can't math. I can't do businessy type things. That's just something other smarter people know how to do. Did that ever like that line of thinking ever occur to you? Absolutely. All the time. I mean, come on, I'm a singer. How would I know how to manage staff, how to run the PL for every business? The first week, so two years went by where I hired different C-suites, CMO, CTO, CEO, CFO, trying to fill the void of my father not being there. I was chairman at the time. Uh, again, they just gave me that, like, I guess we have to give her something. Let's just make her the chairwoman. <laughs> and, wow. uh, and I was the last to wanting to be involved. Absolutely. I had no interest in it. After watching my father get so stressed and leaving us so early, I thought I never would I want to step in with that. But I actually had an Indian saint who kept saying, you can do this. You can do this. She's my guru. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. So eventually I did step in as CEO in the first week, the first first week as if it couldn't have been easier. Um, one of my staff comes up to me and goes, well, Amanda, the merchant services has shut down your ability to pay payroll. So you can't pay anybody. What should we do? And I went, Oh, what's a merchant servicer? Oh, <laughs> oh my gosh. And then that same week I get, you know, they're like, Amanda, you're getting served papers for a lawsuit. I'm like, Oh, huh. Okay. I can do this. It's okay. It's okay. And then in that same week, again, another one of my staff came to me and said, Amanda, we need to change CRM systems. We've spent half a million dollars on Salesforce, but we're thinking that we shouldn't move there at this time because it's a little bit trepidatious. Maybe we should just stay in our current CRM. What do you think? And I went, what's a CRM system? <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> I mean, in every manner, in every way, I was so in over my head. I mean, more than just, I don't know numbers or, you know, it, it was uh, a lot of trust. <laughs> a lot of questions, a lot of, thank God I was surrounded by wonderful people that were brilliant, right? So just soaking it up like a sponge, but then also the whole part of your mental limit, limiting beliefs. And that was a huge part that I learned from my guru with the nonprofit Divine Bliss International. I mean, if it hadn't been for them, we, we wouldn't be here. I mean, mm -hmm. it's an utter miracle that we survived that. I, it's, uh, yeah. And that was really from the just letting go of the limiting beliefs, trusting a lot and a lot of meditation. 
Mm. I'd meditate like five times a day. <laughs> My oh. guru gave me a way to be able to discern answers to questions. So I used that a ton. Awesome. I'm writing that down because I want to circle back to that as somebody that's not great at meditation. But uh, oh, I don't I know if you've ever that. heard of uh, Dan Harris. He has this book called T- um, Meditation for Fidgety Skeptics. And then oh, I just got his God. other book, 10% Happier, that I'm about to dig into. But oh, we'll, we'll circle back to that because, first of all, like first week, everything going to hell, like yeah. rapid fire. Yeah. I love the fact that you just point blank showed people where you were at. What is that? I don't know what a CRM is. Because I think it's so easy for people to get trapped in that pattern of like, I am in business now and I need to show people that I know everything that there is to know, even though I don't really know what you mean by that. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) Was that ever a thought that you felt like you had to do like posture or pressure or like there were people that were surprised that you didn't know this because you're the daughter of Chet Holmes? No, I think everyone was pretty clear that I, I had no idea what I was doing. But but I think the good thing about it was the questions and mm-hmm. the, the questions that I asked. They could tell that I had I had an ability to understand. I just didn't know it yet. Mm-hmm. And um, those that were around me, that stayed around me. Um, gave me that grace and, and, and did assist. And I mean, I ended up innovating our marketing and sales process. We increased our lead flow by 1100%. I doubled our coaching clients two years in a row, just in that first two years. And it's been eight years. Lots has happened since then, but, um, it was a lot of innovation that had to happen. I mean, we'd never processed an order, uh, e-commerce. So that was Mm. the first time I brought everything e-commerce. I brought everything online, did a lot of automating of our processes. So that was my domain of how can I find a faster way to do this where I have my finger on the pulse immediately and I don't have to train the, you know, 80 sales reps before we can implement this strategy. I just want to get it done with the click of my fingers. So that was a big part of what I did and, and, but then in later years, I found the blend of the two of having an understanding of digital marketing and e-commerce with a sales team, man, those mm-hmm. two when you combine them. It's like, you're unstoppable. Oh yeah. I, I've seen online spaces where people kind of go at it with the marketing versus sales. And I'm like marketing and sales, baby, that is the way Absolutely. to go. A little bit of both. It's going to have you take off like a rocket. Uh, and I, Really just love this fact, this idea of people that gave you grace, people that helped out and just answered your questions, because I think a lot of people newer to business or they're in a growth phase often, especially if they're in a freelance or a consultant type role service provider, tend to think like, what could I offer to this business person? They're super smart over here. I don't know what I could have to offer. You have to offer fresh perspective, just like Amanda brought to the business. You have, uh, one of my friends calls it the ability to see the label because you're outside the bottle. And that is the beauty of not being entrenched in a business that you can come into this with a fresh perspective, even if you feel like a beginner and you're in over your head. It's fantastic. Absolutely. I love that. And I'll also add to it that, so my father never formally trained me in the business, Mm -hmm. but I was around him my whole life, right? So my understanding of what business should be was based upon, you know, every dinner conversation, you know, he always took us out with clients, how he trained me in my life and how I ran my music business. Cause I was Mm -hmm. the only, I was the only musician I knew that had a profitable tour going up the West coast, you know, So every step of the way, I intrinsically understood his methodology and it was the only thing that I did know. So when I started Mm -hmm. going to the workplace and seeing that the world outside of my father's techniques was so all over the place, it didn't make sense to me that everyone else was doing it this other way. It only made sense to me to follow what what my father used to teach, right? Because that's Mm -hmm. all I knew. So I did have that um, help. And I think that's also assisted me, you know, because I'm a different generation. My father was a baby boomer. I'm a millennial. The way that I interpret his methodology, they're timeless, but the tactical deployment of each one of his strategies has changed. 
So my natural tendency to do what he did on cold calling, I now do in DMs and Instagram, right? Ooh. So, but it took the innovative mind to understand the strategic objectives and then how the tactical implementation changed. So yeah, I found a lot of that innovation and I did t- a ton of that innovation, especially in the last two years too, with the finish of the book. It took me four years to write the new edition. And then I revamped all of our um, systems and our deliverables and our packages and our services. And I trained all of my teams, right. On all of those things that I updated and renovated for this world post the internet. Cause a lot of my father's methodologies were pre the internet and man, mm-hmm. a lot has changed. Oh, for sure. I remember when people first started uh, freaking out about the privacy changes with Apple, because it was like, we're going to lose so much of this data that we've had access to on the internet. And I was like, but to circle back to something that you mentioned earlier, it, we were able to sell things to people before the internet was a thing, before we could stalk <laughs> people online, we were still able to consistently make sales. So there are tactics that work, even if you don't know what uh, your ideal prospect had for lunch two hours ago, you should still be able to understand what they need from you and help them out. <laughs> Obviously, funny. I'm being a little bit facetious with Facebook no, ads. But but like, it is funny because I still, a majority of the clientele that I serve still don't really, they haven't made that bridge to social selling yet. And yet- mm-hmm. People, salespeople who use social outsell their peers by 78%. So it's a far superior because you can know, you can know what they had for lunch. You can know who they're dating. You can know who their friends are. You can know all of this data and people don't use it in the corporate setting as much. I'm still training a lot on that just to (laughs) to tell them Mm -hmm. that that's an important thing to do. They have to first identify, okay, yeah, that is a competitive edge. So, Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. The more knowledge that you have, the more confident you feel that you can serve that need and speak to that person. I love that. Um, Wow. I'm just looking at all of my notes here. I want to go back to that first week that you talked about, like just being thrown into the fire. Talk about trial by fire. Um, How did you approach handling all of those situations happening at the same time? Right before I stepped in as CEO, I had gone on a trip. It was a last minute thing. Some One of my staff was like, we're going to go climb Kilimanjaro. It's the largest freestanding mountain in the world. Would you like to come? I'm like, you think I could do it? And they're like, of course. And I'm like, <laughs> all right. It was a Thursday. They left on Monday. So I got back home. I had 48 hours to buy gear because I'd never trekked before. And off I was to Africa. And wow. um, turns out that altitude sickness hits people. So if you're a smoker, you actually do better in altitude sickness because you're used Hmm. to your your breath being constricted. But for me, I was a trained um, vocalist, right? So breath, breathing techniques were so critical for me. I just finished my yoga teacher training. So I am so big about breath. I got there on the very first day. I was nauseated. I was the one of the weakest links. It was me and this like 65 year old woman that, that perpetually were the weakest links in the group. (laughs) And, uh, it took five days to walk up Kilimanjaro and then another two down. And it was that moment where, when I looked up at that mountain and I'm like, I don't know if I'm going to make this. And multiple times throughout the trip, I thought I'm not going to make it. You know, everybody thought I wasn't going to make it. And I ended up making it. And I realized at like the very last day, I was like, my eyes were rolling to the back of my head. A guy died that day. Um, it was intense. And I wow. had one guy, one African guy on one arm, another African guy on another arm, and a guy behind me trying to like keep me from falling over as I'm like trying to still climb this mountain. And it made me realize that every m- major achievement takes just one step at a time. And sometimes... <sighs> It's not going to be you by yourself. You're going to need help and you you don't have to do it alone. That was like, that was my biggest takeaway. So then when I got back home, I was like, all right, let's do this. And I stepped in as CEO and, you know, we ran with it. And I still had that first week, I was still like, I, I climbed Kilimanjaro, okay? It's just one step at a time. And, and it, you being a musician, I think you'll appreciate this. Actually, halfway up the mountain, I had this moment where I was like, I'm not going to make this. I, mm. I hate hiking. Why did I ever fly to 
<laughs> Africa <laughs> to climb the largest freestanding mountain. This is absurd. But I had this realization that I didn't have to climb Kilimanjaro or hike Kilimanjaro. I could dance up Kilimanjaro and I love to dance. So I started singing this song that I had written that year. It went, forget the heavy low. Oh, Going on the road, got my shirt, my shoes, my soul. Na 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 na. So it was just slow enough, right? Where like, and that's the speed at which you step climbing Kilimanjaro. It's this slow march. So even mm-hmm. though I looked like I was still walking, I was like moving my head. I was yes. <laughs> I was singing to myself. So that also ties back to how I meditate. I'm very big on mantras because Mm. my guru taught me that when you sit in silence, it only makes your monkey mind get louder. And that's the opposite of what meditation is. Meditation is an altered state of consciousness. And when you use the sound of your own voice in repetition, it helps you elevate faster. Of course, it has to be a positive thing because if you say something Mm -hmm. negative, it's not going to help you elevate. It's going to take you down. So that was one of the meditation techniques I used to manage to get up Kilimanjaro. And I used that over and over and over again. I still, today I sat in in between calls. I just sat down for eight minutes and I sang a a mantra meditation to get myself into flow because it was a really demanding day and (laughs) a lot to get done. I love that. I mean, so many great things. One, Yay voice. Oh my God. I didn't know I was going to get a concert today. Woo! Uh, and they're going to be even more jealous that they don't get to see this video. Cause I was over here grooving my inner, <laughs> my inner blues vocalist was like, yes, you're speaking my love language. So there's that. I also love that you highlighted this just one step at a time. Cause I think that's the overlooked thing, especially in this day and age of instant connection, instant replies, You don't have to, just because all of those things were handed to you at the same time, doesn't mean that you have to handle them all right now, one step at a time, with help, not out there in front of the army, Jon Snow style, trying to fight her. (laughs) (laughs) I might have dated myself with that reference. That's a Game of Thrones reference when Jon decided that he was going to take on an entire army by himself. And then, of course, all of his friends and allies came rushing up behind him to help fight. Um, (laughs) awesome i don't think that's dating i think everybody true. Has game of thrones yeah it's not so it funny. kind of feels like forever ago now but it also could be that the the new show just came out so i don't know time is weird especially since the pandemic it's just it's gotten kind of crazy um i love this idea of meditation because i know for a long time i i grew up in south texas and i had a lot of skepticism over anything that could perceive to be like hippie woo out there And then I realized that I had accidentally created a mantra of my own Mm. uh, during a really stressful time in my life when I was about to lose my apartment. And I was just repeat, I would wake up in the middle of the night with thoughts racing, already fully awake with these thoughts and these questions and these worries. And somewhere along the way, I just started saying strength, peace, faith in myself, just over and over and over again. And that with some like breathing deeply, making sure that I was doing it slowly. And every time a thought popped in, went right back to that. I didn't even realize that that was meditation until years later when I was like, oh, oh, okay. I don't like how we attach these stigmas to things that are super useful and Mm -hmm. a lot more simple than they might seem. Absolutely. That's wonderful. (laughs) And you said that you have a guru that helps you with yours. How did you get into that? Uh, my, when my father got ill, we were looking for alternatives and we looked at, Mm. I mean, we had two people on staff full time looking through all the different possibilities. And we saw about 150 of the best experts in the world, everything you could imagine, sound therapy, light therapy, oxygenation therapy. I studied with monks from Japan. And then when I met Guruji, I, I mean, she was leagues beyond anybody else. Just being around her, I felt more peaceful. I felt more calm. I felt more contented. And uh, 
yeah. And by the time she had met my father, he had already gone down the medical path so far. There was really not much that could be done, but she told me I had celiacs at the time. And mm. uh, so I was, if this, I couldn't be in a pizza parlor, the smell of pizza would make me nauseated. If I ate oh, wow. it, I would go to the hospital. And she said, every disease is just a disease of your mind. I could assist you to cure yourself of celiacs. And I went, no Western doctors ever told me that. And <laughs> Lo and behold, she did. She assisted oh, me. Wow. I now can eat wheat. Yeah, I went to one of her centers. At that time, it was in Singapore. Now there's one in Florida as well. And she helped me rebuild my stomach lining. And now I can eat wheat. Holy cow. Wow, yeah. that is amazing. I, I mean, I've always had this inkling that the brain was way more powerful than we gave it credit for. But stories yeah. like that just they expand my mind even more. Uh, and I feel myself becoming less anti-woo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And the, the mind is a very powerful thing. Absolutely. Very powerful. I love that, you know, abrupt left turn here too, because I'm going to go back to the music. Like you used your skills and what you picked up with your dad, just kind of being around him, being in his presence, being part of his world as he was taking people out to dinner and whatnot to build your own profitable business as a musician. I know there are several musicians listening here that would be interested to hear a little (laughs) bit more about that. Are you open to sharing? (laughs) That's hilarious. So, so I booked my tours, um, up the coast and I would, I would play anywhere. Anybody would have me, right. Any kind of coffee shop or bar, you know, pub busk on the side of the street, whatever it took. And, uh, I was definitely, it's like any business, you know, you, you think that, okay, I create the product or I create the service and people will come and Mm -hmm. then they don't come. (laughs) So it was the same thing with a musician. You sit in a corner of a coffee shop and you're playing music and you hope that they'll come and ask for your CD, but you don't really know if they're going to, I don't even know what they sell today. At my time, it was selling CDs, but I would throughout a set half of the time would be me talking about my tip jar in some entertaining, Mm. engaging way that I had songs about my tip jar. I would talk about the tip jar being hungry. We'd crack jokes (laughs) about the tip jar. I talked to, I would believe that every person that was in the vicinity of me when I was singing in an event that they were about to be a part of an experience with me. So they would walk away every single person. I would know their name in the room if it was one of those smaller rooms. And we'd be having a dialogue through the whole thing. And I'd say, don't you want to commemorate this experience that we've had together and take home a CD so you can remember forever how this was, right? I mean, Mm -hmm. (laughs) I was shameful. It was ridiculous, but highly entertaining. I think I only had one person ever say, you know, you talked about your tip jar way too much. One out of thousands of people. So I think I did okay. And even after I would sell, so I would close a hundred percent of the room. I mean, there was no doubt in my mind that every single person was walking away with a CD, but then I'm like, okay, well, how do I upsell this? And my CDs are only like five, 10 bucks. So what can I do to get more? So then I started saying, if if you fill my tip jar, I will walk on my hands across the stage because I used to be a a competitive gymnast. And I just thought, I think people will find this funny. I would have people get up from the crowd and walk around the room and go, give her money. I want to see her walk on her hands on stage. (laughs) Now, it wasn't like anybody ever told me to do these things, right? It's just being around the ultimate sales machine my whole life. I think I was just, I just couldn't help, but I knew that, okay, how do I close everybody in the room? Okay. How do I upsell them? Okay. Cause I got to pay for gas. Cause I got to pay, right. I got to mm-hmm. make this profitable. It's just, it was inherently part of me. It was, I don't know, flowing through my DNA or something. Cause I've never seen any musician do how I <laughs> ran a show. Yeah. different. I love that. And I thought like, I love that whole shameless approach to it. Cause I think we can too often, especially if we're building something that's kind of close to our heart, like musician, like like being a musician, like being a creative or, uh, you know, early stage consultants and stuff like that. It's a piece of you, whatever you're building. So it's hard not to take that personally. And it's hard to remove that. Like, are you going to judge it? I worked really hard on this. I want I just want you to love it as much as I do. But you transformed them from spectators into participants. And that's yes. what I love about that. That was one of the only skills that carried over from singer-songwriter to CEO (laughs) (laughs) because 
when I took over, then I started running webinars. So I'd have 400, Mm. 500 CEOs on a call. And because I was so used to bantering with my crowds as a singer songwriter, it was so easy for me to run a webinar and go, Hey, raise your hand. Hey, say yes. Hey, how you doing, Bill? Hey, how you doing, Bob? Are you going, you know, I had that part down and I had the script from my father on doubling sales. And this is how you double sales. And this is how you treat, teach doubling sales. So I, so that was one of the only tips that I think Mm -hmm. I got from my singer songwriter days. And I love that. It's like when I keynote now, like I was just running a dress rehearsal for HubSpot. I'm speaking at HubSpot in a few weeks, their inbound event. And they're like, you're so engaged with me. I'm like, Mm -hmm. singer songwriter. Yeah. Oh, that's like, yeah. Performers almost have this advantage over folks that are not performers too, because the energy level in the room is completely different if people are disconnected and disengaged. So you got to find that way to connect and make them part of the show. I love that you came up with walking on your hands to be like, yep. And turning people into basically like an army, like, no, give her, give her money. I actually, you would probably appreciate this also as a musician because I weaseled my way into my first band. Yes. Weaseled my way in. Um, I tried to audition for them several times and they're like, we're just not really looking for a singer right now. So I started being the unofficial tip jar girl. And every time they were out at a place, I would show up there. They would let me do kind of a couple open mics with them, but they would largely perform their set. And I would take the tip jar around and just badger people for it in a, in a playful way. But I would be like, <laughs> look at these guys up there working so hard. They're entertaining you. And they're like, I don't have any cash. I'm like, hey, uh, bartender Jessica is happy to charge uh, five extra dollars to the tab and give me some cash to put in the jar. You could buy them a beer. They're like, nah, I don't, I don't have my card on me. I'm like, do you get here in a car? Is there change in your seat? We're not too proud for pennies here. And I think I wound up like tripling or quadrupling their tip intake at one point. And then they were like, uh, so are you still interested in singing? And I was like, yeah, actually, I am. the hustle is real. You know it. I mm-hmm. love that. So if nothing else buys the beer, if you've only got your card here, that's fine. We'll take beer. It's fine. Oh, it's hysterical. <laughs> oh, man. And I, you know, to talk about all of this. I love that that is transferable skills, which we don't give too much credit for. And especially when I'm working with entrepreneurs that are making an abrupt change, say they're coming out of corporate America and they're starting their business. There's often this sense of kind of to tie into Kilimanjaro. Well, I was on the top of that mountain over there and now I have to start at the bottom of this one. And I'm like, no, I mean, those skills allow you to build a bridge and just like hop right across to the top of this mountain. You're not as far down as you think. Uh, have you seen that in your experience? I love that analogy that definitely resonates with me. Mm-hmm. Because I don't, I don't think that there are people out there that would necessarily consider the skills that we developed out there hustling as musicians to be the same things that you use to command a room when you are presenting for HubSpot. Like, wow. I think that that's critical piece of advice as well is what are you great at and work towards those strengths. And as soon as you can quickly identify where your strengths aren't, how can you surround yourself with people that do have those strengths? You don't Mm. have to be everything, right? I have people in my staff. I surround myself by so many people that are structure oriented because I am not. Me either. <laughs> and it's so great to have like I will I I will, I'm very good at the vision. I can think, you know, this is what it's going to be in 10 years. This is what it's going to be in 15 years. Um and that's fantastic. Now our next steps over the next, you know, 5 months, we I, I it's good to have that banter with somebody else to break down all of those steps to get there. Mm -hmm. I love that. That goes back to that whole concept of no man is an island. I don't even remember where that comes from, but that's just kind of part of the culture now. And yet with this kind of American exceptionalism kind of undercurrents that happens in business, uh, there's often that pressure to just go it alone. Like I can't show any weakness. I can't show anybody that I don't know what I'm doing. And that was kind of the impetus just behind creating this show because I realized uh, how flawed my thinking was and how I almost stunted my own growth for so long by refusing mm. to seek help, by refusing to appear quote unquote weak. Uh, and now I almost have the opposite stance where like I can tell someone 
weak is not the right word to use for this, but like they're not as strong as they're pretending to be. If I can see them uh, presenting that invulnerable, unflawed finish to everybody, it's like we've all we're we're all people. We're all just people in business. Absolutely. I, I've done a lot of work within my team of identifying people that share similar values. Mm. Uh, and that's been a big change because when I inherited the company, I, I was not in alignment with the culture. Mm. It was a very different culture that my father created and it worked for him, but it didn't work for me. And it's only been in the last... Uh, man, maybe two years that I've really taken my team and made them uh, similar in values. What I find very often my team will say is, you know, uh, I've made my wealth. Now I'm just looking to give back and assist Mm -hmm. people. So more often than not, I'm surrounded by people that are more focused on how do I serve how am I assisting? Uh, how can we make a positive impact? We're even trying to focus our uh, efforts when we're going outbound to businesses, looking for impact-driven companies and CEOs, because that is our value system. And so many more of my staff are becoming that clarity that we're attracting that uh, type of business, which is mm-hmm. exciting and thrilling. I think that's amazing. I And it it took me a long time in business too to realize that that was a stand that you, that was a stake that you could put in the ground and say, this is where I stand. This is what I believe in. And that that will actually bring more people to you than it will chase away. And especially now, like I've I've said it a couple of times on the show in the past, I used to worry about whether or not people would like me. It's a very womanly thing to do. I just want to be likable. I just don't want people to be upset at me. And somewhere along the way, as I've learned to, stand behind that stake in the ground and go, nope, this is me. This is what I like. And it's not for everybody. And that's okay. I started asking myself, well, do I like that person? If the answer is no, then I don't really care if they don't like me. It's cool. We're just not for each other. You can do your thing. I'll cheer you on from over here. Go do you that, that thing that I don't like you do that. Somebody else likes it. (laughs) That's actually, that was another big thing that my guru guided me on. So when I inherited the company, I, was so focused on what everybody else thought of me and what Mm. if I mess up and, you know, I could ruin my father's legacy and all of this. She had recommended that I shave my head to release my own attachment to what other people's expectations on me were. And if I shaved my head, it was in a place of surrender to commit to myself that I will be the best version of me. And Mm -hmm. it took me years. I would wear my hair back every day, trying to like get up, like someday I'm going to be bald. So, you know, I should try to look like I am bald and just tie my hair back. And eventually I did shave my head and I actually ended up shaving it for five years because I loved, I loved the feeling of liberation that I felt releasing myself from the confines of what I believed other people should think of me or their opinions. I mean, I'm Mm -hmm. not perfect. I, you know, I've grown back my hair and there's a lot to be learned there, but what a profound experience it was to, um, try to just be committed to the best version of me. Mm-hmm. I love that. And that's such a, wow. Like I felt the tug at the heartstrings because who doesn't want to protect such a strong legacy of this person that they adore and has made already a great impact in a lot of people's lives. You obviously want to keep that going and to surrender for a long time. I thought of that as a super negative, this concept of surrender. It means give up. I am done fighting. I am weak. Right. But mm-hmm. surrender, I think helps you realize that there are certain things that you can't control, like how other people think of you, what their perception of you is. All I can control is me. And I don't know. I mean, I've had long hair forever. I'm like sitting here shaking out my ponytail hair. Mm -mm, Maybe, maybe someday I will experiment with just shaving it all off and going free. (laughs) It's a wild experience. It all depends on the intention behind it as well. Mm Mm-hmm. And wow, this just sounds amazing. I'm going to sound like a little bit of a kiss ass for a second here, but I just can't help myself. Running a company, walking up a mountain, being a musician, having this guru, like you have accomplished so much 
so much in your life. Uh, and I just can't help but be in awe. I hope I'm not making you uncomfortable by saying that. I think that's so amazing that you've accomplished all of this. And there also might be some folks out there that think like, well, Amanda's an exceptional person, but I don't know that I could achieve the same kind of thing. Do you have any advice for somebody like that? I know I kind of put you on the spot with that one. So. Yeah, I, um, I think that the world creates boxes and frames mm. and our families determine who we should be or who we are. Our friends try to tell us who we are, who we should be. And what we see around society says this as well. And um, ultimately at the end of the day, it's really about how you feel about yourself. Like when you put your head down at night, do you feel contented with who you were that day and what you did? Because the only person that will know is you ultimately. So at the end of every night, right before bed, I've even done it before in classes under my guru is she would have us write down like, what are all the things that you did that were positive towards your true self? And then what are all the things that were, you know, not really on that path, maybe the opposite. And you'd list them to just acknowledge, okay, this is some place where I'm making positive improvements. And this is some place where I'm holding myself back. Uh, mm -hmm. or, or downward spiraling. And so ultimately, I guess it just comes back to tuning into you, asking yourself the question, what makes me the best version of me? How can I be, mm, my guru would call it my higher self. I want to mm -hmm. be my higher self. One of the, one of the mantras that I would say every day and throughout the day is I grant myself permission to connect to my higher self please guide me to be a conduit of light and love. And mm. as long as that was my goal and that was my focus, I felt that my, my pathway becomes more clear and more fulfilling and more enriched. And I become more of a magnet that attracts the things that I want into my life rather than me having to chase after something. As long as my intention is clear, uh, Oh, wow. I th that's amazing. And I discovered the the power of acknowledgements recently myself with a coach that I've been working with. And the thing that I really want to highlight and unpack about what you said that I thought was so cool was your mantra is focusing on being love and light for people. And that is something that is totally within your control. Whereas I think so many times we get hung up on the doing, right? We think we're human doings instead of human beings and mm -hmm. that our worth is tied to our work. And unless we are bestseller status and running this 50 bajillion dollar company that we're somehow less than, and then we get in these bad habits of like having goals, having intentions, falling short of our own expectations and our goals for ourselves, and then just like piling on. And that's why I love this acknowledgement process because yeah, there, there's going to be shortcomings. There's going to be missteps, mistakes, failures, and things like that. But if you're also working equally hard to point out the progress that you've made and celebrate the little wins along with the big ones, then I think it becomes easier to see yourself as a human that's striving to get better every single day. Mm, I just want to like, I don't know. I want, I want to like reach through and high five you. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, wow. This is amazing. So let's let's turn it back to the business. So now it's been eight years and obviously you have found your stride and done some really great things with this company. What's next for you with Chet Holmes International? So, for instance, updating the book, uh, mm -hmm. Ultimate Sales Machine. Um, it took me four years to update that. And a lot of it was around marketing because over the last 15 years, right, uh, we went from the average company doing seven different marketing mediums to promote their business to now it's on average 13 different marketing mediums with five social media platforms and three paid advertising techniques. So we're doing double the amount of work for a fraction of that result. Mm -hmm. uh, so 
a big part of what I've realized is my father had 12 core competencies for doubling sales. And this was before the internet, right? So information was still this rare commodity. Today, information is so plentiful that it's really about getting as simple as possible and getting as focused as possible. So while my father had 12, I'm really honing in on two, maybe three max and really getting yeah, simplifying everything that my father created. So um, for instance, chapter seven is the seven muscles of marketing and he would go through all seven. And I took that and looked at it and uh, actually had a book coach to assist me with this. And man, it makes such a huge difference when you have a coach. I don't care what you do in any part of your life, you should have a coach. This has been Mm -hmm. a huge realization for me. I get places so much faster when I just have somebody guiding me that's already been there. So Julianne Eason helped me with this book rewrite. I never would have finished it if I remember her. (laughs) And uh, she's like, you know what? People need checklists. People Mm -hmm. need, businesses need checklists to determine uh, what to do because we're doing double the amount of, you know, marketing work. So we put together just a five point checklist that everyone should follow when deciding if this is a right marketing technique, because so many marketing techniques will adapt and change and new ones will come and go versus the last half century, the real, the two only innovations that we had were from radio to television. And then you Mm -hmm. look at the last 15 years And it's absurd the amount of uh, speed at which we're innovating. So it's really about getting back to the basics, simplifying um, and giving people actionable step-by-step solutions. So like I also innovated a a boot camp where people come in and it's a whole bunch of businesses from all around different industries that are all learning how to adapt my father's techniques that they read in the book. But it's so cool to have everybody in community to one another that are assisting each other and the collaboration that happens where it's like, okay, this week you're learning how to triple your sales conversions. Okay. Over the next seven days, Everybody try to triple your sales conversions. What sales can you close? What leads can you generate? Ready, set, go. Who's going to win between this week and next? Go, 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 right? And then everybody's (laughs) trying to make it happen. And we're sharing in a Facebook group and we get back on. Okay, how did it go? What did you do? What did you do? And it just builds this momentum and this, and the ability to implement something is so much quicker too, because of the use of the internet. And Mm -hmm. so I've just been having a blast making things as simple easy to understand as possible uh, so that, because my success is based on everyone else's success. I mean, I'm not here to, I don't know. I don't really like Mm -hmm. to hear myself talk. So (laughs) I like to hear you talk. (laughs) So basically, I I think it's incredible that you turned that into a little bit of friendly competition because talk about short circuiting the nerves and the overwhelm and the overthinking that kicks in when you do that. I, you know, I used to be a type A. I know that you wouldn't be able to tell it from me sitting here in my Jack Skellington hoodie recording this podcast with you. But, uh, you know, I was, I knew what it took, the step, here are all of the steps in the right order that you follow to get the A. So when I was getting my master's degree, I encountered the most frustrating class of my life. And I think it will, this is, I think the first time that I'm sharing this story on the podcast, believe it or not, it was called entrepreneurship. And it was taught by a lady who uh, did a lot of like venture capitalist investment, investment, very smart lady. But I was so frustrated because I could never figure out how to get an A in her class. Me and my type A buddies, we spent like two weeks on this faux pitch deck. And she was like, eh, B. And we were so mad because we knew somebody else that got an A had like just thrown it together the day before. So the next time we had a pitch deck, we threw it together the day before. And she was like, mm, yeah, like A minus, that's fine. Uh, and it was so frustrating. And then fast forward a couple of weeks, I'm with these, the same super over overachiever women group of people that are like, yes, I'm going to nail entrepreneurship. I'm going to find out what it takes to be the best. And she walks in and she tells us to get in our groups and she just slams down a $50 bill on everybody's table. And she goes, using this money and only this money, to be clear, you do not get to add your own personal money to this. Use this $50 and go make me more money. You have two weeks, go. By the way, the team that makes the most money wins all of the money. Go. (laughs) Like I think that ties back to your story in that it turned it into a friendly competition. Like, how do I out earn all of these other people? But the time constraints, 
the guardrails that were put in it and that like the speed of implementation with which we just had to go out and make things happen meant that we didn't have the luxury of sitting around and coming up with the perfect plan and the perfect funnel and like, oh my gosh, how are we going to do all this? Um, we focused on what are the problems that we can solve and how quickly can we solve this problem? So we figured out fairly early on that our hall was one of the few on campus that didn't have any kind of snack or meal section. All we had was vending machines. So me being a pastry chef's daughter, I was like, yeah, bake sale time, making all of this gluten products because I didn't know any better at the time. But uh, we made a whole bunch of snacks. We're selling those in between classes, did gang bucks, busters. I think we did like $400 in a, in a matter of weeks. We did like art classes and all kinds of stress relief for these uptight grad students and, and things like mm -hmm. that. The group that beat us, because we came in seconds, they took our idea and did it way better than we, and, and like with way less work because they took their $50 to a local restaurant, negotiated with them. Like you give us a certain amount of meals, we'll go sell them and then bring you back that money and buy more. Uh, they sold lunch in that hall for the next two weeks uh -huh. and took us all to the cleaners, basically. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. And in retrospect, I was like, I hated that class at the time. I'm like, why can't I win? And then all these years later, I'm like, wow, I wish everybody had that kind of class. Just go out and find a problem that you can solve and get to work solving it. I love that. Well, since information is so, I, it's a great story. Holy cow. What a great <laughs> story. Fascinating. I love it. Um, it, it makes me think of, so online people that do courses, 96% of people that sign up for a course, never actually finish it. 96%. It's only 4% that finish it. So I've been, I'm really big about data and analytics. I also have an analytics part of my company where we find that for companies and help them put that into their marketing and sales story. But, uh, so I tracked what was the results of the people going through this boot camp? And 46% of them generated leads within 30 days, and 32% of them generated sales within the 30 days. And a lot of my clientele are more B2B. Their sales mm -hmm. process is a lot longer than 30 days, right? So if I had tracked six months out, I'm sure I would have seen even more. But I'm looking at that and going, okay, industry average is. 4% and that's just completion. They're not even tracking results. We're getting 10 times industry standard, but really where's it coming from? If we tie all this back, it's coming back to the intention. I'm really, I do this because I, I want to see people succeed. You know, yes. I want, I'm here to serve. And what makes my head happy when I lay it down at night is seeing other people see their dreams come true. So they need that support. Sometimes it's one-on-one, -on -one, sometimes it's in a group, sometimes we do it for them. There's so many different ways, but it all comes down to knowing that you're not the smartest person in the room and maybe be great to get some assistance because a lot of the time CEOs have a hard time to accept that as well. <laughs> that is the truth right there. And I love that. At the end of the day, my measure of success is who did I lift up? Who did I help? How did I make a difference today? Mm, that's the success metric I want for all of us. Yes, money is nice. And also, I think you get a lot of money by helping other people get what they want, right? Just help. Just help. It's all good. I I hate to say it because I do run a sales organization, <laughs> sales, but my that is more of my metric. And I'm more and when I focus on that, our sales improve. We're up 379% from last year. And I'm not, you know crazy obsessive about, okay, have we gotten this number? Have we, it's just about where do I come from, from a place of service? Mm, I love that. I think that's the perfect note to wrap on. So tell us more about all of these programs. Cause I'm sure everybody wants to be part of that sales boot camp now that they've heard this story. <laughs> yeah. Um, actually, if you go to ultimate sales you can pick up your copy of the book, which has a bunch of wonderful bonuses in it. And it'll actually give more information too there. I Excellent. think that would then lead into some education, some free trainings around doubling your sales and all that goodness. That's a great place to start. UltimateSalesMachine.com. Excellent. I'm going to make sure that they have a clickable link in the show notes. This has been a fascinating conversation. I can't even tell you how much like energy and joy I have now. It's just go about the rest of my day. It's wonderful. I think they're going to love this episode and thank you so much for being on the show. 
Thank you. It's been such a pleasure, Angie. So that is it. Another awesome episode of Permission to Kick Ass on the Books. If you want to know more about the show, if you want to know more about me, Angie Coley, and the mission I'm on to help entrepreneurs punch fear in the face and do big, bold things, then head on over to permissiontokickass.com. That is all one word together, permissiontokickass.com. Make sure to sign up for my email list so that you know whenever there's a hot, fresh, and ready podcast episode out for you. And also on Mondays, I like to send out a little newsletter called Kick Monday's Ass. I'm sure you're totally, totally surprised by that. So thank you for being here with me today. I'm Angie Coley. Make sure that you share this with a friend that needs to hear this message today. Like it, share it, comment wherever you're listening to this today. And let's go kick some ass.